Uh, just a, a little note on remembering our origins from our lunch discussion. My advisor, Alfred, just spoke before me. So, um, and you'll see a little bit of IO in there too. <laughs> can't, I can't help it. Um, okay, well, so um, I'm gonna talk about a field analog for a, an exoplanet, which is exciting. Maybe some others have come up with this, but I'm not sure. Um, first of all, I just wanna uh, give a little note about how field analogs are valuable. And we've been doing this in a number of locations around the Earth. Um, on the right is a picture of some linear features on the surface of Mars. And we've come to understand that these, these uh, striated landforms are formed by wind dominantly. And there are a lot of these on Mars. Um, they uh, occur there because Mars has been a wind dominated landscape for billions of years. But it turns out we also have them on Earth. And they're in kind of difficult to get to locations where wind is mostly in control. And so we've gone to visit those, those yardangs to try to understand them better. I should note too, we also see them on Titan. And look at the resolution we have for these on Titan. Can you imagine how many arguments we got in before some of us have settled on the idea that these are yardangs? Um, and so, you know, we, but we have very little to go on, especially for Titan in understanding these. And so we go out to the analogs on Earth and here are some in China. And um, first we can look at them from overhead at much better resolution than either place and um, notice some things about them. Uh, one thing to point out here is that the, the grays in the background are gravels and there are some gravel ripples in between the yardangs. And just kind of briefly, because I wanna take time on the other things, what we found in our field studies is that not only wind is important for yardangs, but also the bedrock qualities themselves and they form in just kind of a small range of types of bedrock that we can then use to translate to our understanding of what's going on on, on Mars and and Titan in particular, what they're made of. And then also we've found that rainfall affects these in very different ways. Um, and so that we think there's rainfall in Titan even, and, and there wasn't a past on Mars. And then these gravels are ubiquitous everywhere. And the gravels are starting to play a very strong role in the story and only because we go and stand there in the field for five days and try to understand them better. So um, field analogs are, are very important, but uh, you know, as we found out today, we've yet to even see uh, I should say a terrestrial exoplanet. Um, and so how can we possibly have field analogs for exoplanets? And here is one of the uh, Trappist bodies, uh, an artist rendition. Um, and it's mainly because they're, they're still planetary surfaces and we're understanding the, the range of uh, possibility for them. And so um, it, what we have on the Earth are, are similar, you know, first of all, the similar physics that's going on. And then on Earth, compared with other planets in the solar system, there's a really wide range of of um, landforms and processes and uh, energies available at Earth. And so there are a lot of things we can do on Earth to better understand exoplanets before we even get there to see them. Okay, so a carbon planet, this is, here's another artist's um, rendition of a carbon planet. These features are postulated to form in nebular environments that have a lot of carbon. And uh, especially when the carbon to oxygen exceeds 0.8 in the disk, then we may start to form a carbon planet. And there are some estimates that these even reach something like 75% carbon in a single body in the habitable zone. So uh, these things could possibly exist. So we ought to think about them, think about their characteristics. And even in our own solar system, uh, carbon can be enriched in certain locations. And we've, uh, there's, there's a study of mercury, um, some, some uh, studies of the, the composition of mercury from the messenger probe that indicate that there are concentrations of graphite on the surface. This isn't a picture of graphite on the surface, but a crater that shows dark features around. So I thought it's kind of like a graphite. So um, it, what uh, may have occurred is that we could have this thin graphite crust on what could have been a magma ocean in the past on Mercury. So even some locations on our own nebula could have been enriched in carbon. If we look at the possibility of carbon planets around M dwarfs, um, it, it could turn out that these bodies spend millions or even billions of years closer than the habitable zone because of the, the ultra-luminous pre-main sequence stage. And so a planet in that situation might be in a runaway greenhouse condition, in which case all the water on the surface ends up um, being sent up to the upper atmosphere, being photolyzed uh, up there. All the light hydrogen would leave and leaves behind the, the oxygen. So you could actually build a really uh, oxygen rich atmosphere under those conditions. Um, and so we might ask these, these questions, what happens when an oxygen rich atmosphere reacts with the surface carbon? 
kind of a situation we have there. Also, how does this affect the surface albedo of a carbon planet and the atmospheric composition over time, the exchange between the atmosphere and the surface? Okay. Uh, there's another condition here too. This should be G-dwarf G G -dwarf star carbon planets. So this is more, this is closer to what we'd have um, at Earth. Um, planets in the habitable zone around this kind of star could experience more of a kind of a, a reducing Archean-like atmosphere because that's what the Earth underwent uh, early in its history. So that means oxygen poor. And so how carbon surfaces interact with Archean atmosphere, um, atmospheres could reveal how the conditions on such a surface might have evolved to be right for life, such as on Earth. Okay, so uh, let's turn to this volcano in Tanzania. Um, it's called Old Doinyo Lengai. Has anybody been there before? No, okay, I haven't either. So a lot of this, <laughs> I should say, um, this is what we're planning to do at Old Doinyo Lengai. I will tell you why we think it's such a great location for us to go visit. Um, but right now what's happening here is that it is, it is erupting right now carbon rich lavas. These are called carbonatites or natrocarbonatite lavas. They're made of dominantly CO2, um, Na2O, K2O, and CaO. Those are the, the components. You don't see silicon in there, right? Um, and we think that these things, and, and there are a variety of ideas for how we get these, but essentially it's in the East African rift zone. So here the crust is very thin, the mantle is very close to the surface. So there are high degrees of, of partial melt of, in this case, we think enriched mantle. And uh, as opposed to where you have thinning of the crust and, and uh, the mantle that's been erupting over time at mid-ocean ridges, you end up depleting that crust. But this has not yet produced more than a, a line of thin volcanoes. And so we still have a lot of sort of everything that was in the mantle still present in that, in that uh, mantle close to the surface. So all you need to do is just melt it um, to high degrees and you may end up just getting these carbon rich lava flows. That's a, a really interesting idea. Um, and, and so what's fascinating about these is that they're actually pretty cool. They erupt at just about 600 C maximum. And as they erupt, they come out black and then they gradually change to white. And here you can see that in this image right here. This is a nighttime image. And here's a daytime image in the day. You can't even see the red because it's really too cool. And uh, you see the, the young black flows coming out right here. Um, it has a similar flow morphology to basalt, as you can see. There are these little, call them hornitos, that come up that, that look really similar to in a basalt lava flow field. The viscosity is quite a bit lower. It's 10 times lower than basalt. It's a little bit like mud. And there have been pretty extensive field and laboratory studies on their rheology. Back during the mid-90s, there was a big field campaign. And so scientists at that time went and obtained some lavas and did the basic um, analyses of them. Here's a video of a mud volcano. <laughs> uh, this is in actual mud, and this is in the Salton Sea. Uh, but just to kind of give you a sense, I did see some uh, videos of the Old Doña Lengai volcano erupting, and it looks really similar. This is the kind of viscosity we're dealing with. I call this a little miniature mud lava lake. <laughs> and uh, so sorry about the low resolution here on this picture, but it's, it's a pretty old picture. And um, what tends to happen is that this, this is actually a stratovolcano, a silica-rich stratovolcano that builds up a cone with gas-rich eruptions. And then uh, once it's kind of in between the, the uh, cone building stage, it will fill, the crater will fill with these carbonatite lavas and create a very flat, you can see how flat that surface is because of the low viscosity of the lavas. And it just fills it up and then it runs off to the side. And so the crater will collapse and then fills gradually up to the top and then collapses again. And so I found a video of it filled right to the top. You can walk right up to it, but that was in the 90s and it's collapsed since then and is back down. But it's gradually filling and uh, I've been talking to guides and it's just about to the point where you can walk back down to the floor again. It's very close to that. So uh, the time is right for going to visit this volcano again. Here's an overhead view of that uh, crater. That summit crater we were looking at is just about a, a half a kilometer across. And there are these uh, thin, bright, uh, carbon-rich lava flows that are radiating away from that uh, central central cone. Okay, so there are some questions we want to ask that are relevant to our understanding of carbon planets. The first thing is colors. Um, what, what in particular causes these lavas to be black or white? And uh, everything that we've looked at in the literature about the lavas um, indicates that it seems like it's oxygen, but that's not, the study has not been done in detail to, to determine that. If it's oxygen that causes the black to change to white, uh, within about a day or two is, is when it happens, 
then that means that as we're looking at carbon planets, if we see a white surface, there's probably oxygen-rich atmosphere. If we see a black surface, it's probably oxygen-poor or Archean atmosphere. And then I wonder about a mix. Well, maybe there's such a high volcanic output that it hasn't had time to change over to the white from the black. Um, but what we want to do is do some field studies to monitor these changes. You know, first of all, could we, you know, chip away at the at the surface lavas, look underneath and see if if those lavas are unaltered because they're buried and they're away from the atmosphere. Um, also, there are other things to look for um, con concerning the petrology. If they devitrified, the glasses sometimes return back to crystals, and that's true for silicates. What would that look like for these carbon-rich lavas, and how does that affect the color? And, and then we would like to do some lab studies. So we want to take these um, lavas, bring them back home, remelt them in the lab, and then gradually expose them to uh, different kinds of atmospheres. These uh, tests have not been done on these lavas. So first we start with an Archean atmosphere, see if that stays black um, for, you know, infinitely, if we, don't introduce, if we don't introduce oxygen, then how quickly does it change to that white? Um, are there any other albedos in between that we could, that we could imagine from other atmospheric compositions? Um, other things we can look at, too, for old oinia lengai are, that can relate to carbon planets are resurfacing rate. So we could use the lava flow rates that we see in the field, um, just observe how, how quickly the lava is coming out, how quickly it's covering up new ground, and uh, look at the topography and also look at the temperature distribution to help kind of obtain a resurfacing rate. Um, we can get temperatures from uh, these near-infrared instruments. This is a, a handheld camcorder that's been calibrated for temperature. You can see this is actually lava in Kilauea taken in the daytime. So there's a little bit of sunlight here, but we reach temperatures of 800 degrees here. And uh, at nighttime in a, in a lava lake, we get right up to the 1100 or so degrees centigrade that's typical for um, basalt lavas. But you can see where the breakouts are and where, where the temperature distribution is here and we can use that to obtain um, a, a heat flow. And then we can do topography from a drone overflight, which I checked is okay there. <laughs> and uh, we can also walk along the rim with a handheld camera in the event that the drone doesn't work. And, um, and then we get these flow rates from field observations. And so we kind of have you know, our, our little crater kind of uh, sense of, of the resurfacing rate, but uh, then we can use that to extrapolate up to carbon planets. How quickly can we put new material out on the surface and expose that new material to an atmosphere, for example? And um, this relates to um, our thoughts about what, what could be going on inside of carbon planets. Um, on Earth, we know that plate tectonics cycles the carbon dioxide. We've talked a bit already about Earth uh, or about tectonics in, in planets during this meeting, but plate tectonics cycles the carbon dioxide by bringing it down into the interior and then erupting it back out again through uh, volcanism. This helps to stabilize the surface temperature, um, helps to regulate the volatiles in the atmosphere. Um, and so on carbon worlds, what we understand is that, you know, let's imagine a mantle that's made entirely of kind of carbon, mostly carbon and not silicon. And under those conditions, we could have very low melting temperatures and really low viscosities like we talked about before. So you could have vigorous convection in the mantle and under the situation where we've got an asthenosphere, um, which is really important, then maybe we could have plate tectonics. Um, that's something to keep in mind that's, that's important as we think about tectonism is we could have this mantle convection, but um, you know, as for example, in the case of Venus, there's not a mobile layer there, and so we don't have plate tectonics. Uh, maybe more important than water, as was mentioned before, is this presence of an asthenosphere. Um, let's say we just add some silicon to the interior. And so maybe instead we have a mantle that's silica carbide. And uh, this material is a really hard and high temperature, very insulating material. Uh, this is similar to what Edwin Kite talked about at uh, EPSC last fall, kind of like a ceramic, okay? And that ceramic is really resistant to convection, it's resistant to heat flow, it's resistant to all kinds of things. And so in order to communicate that heat out to the surface, maybe it's under a condition of a heat pipe mechanism. And this is a different kind of tectonism. Uh, what's going on here is, is, here's our IO. This is what we think is going on on IO. And that is that we're bringing the hot uh, material directly up to the surface. And then because it's being delivered to the surface, it's actually kind of forcing the cold crust down into the mantle and thereby recycling all the atmospheric volatiles that have been placed onto the surface. And uh, we think that this is, well, it's been postulated by Moore uh, in 2019 that this might have been a viable mechanism for um, planets for early Earth, for example, for it's even postulated early Moon, early Venus, 
and other places, but now is only present on Io. Uh, but we should look for this on, uh, in general in other exoplanets. So then finally, both these tectonic models remove oxygen and carbon dioxide and help make the atmosphere habitable. Uh, it turns out the free oxygen is pretty reactive and might inhibit the formation of, of large biomolecules. Um, but it, if we have no global tectonism, there's no atmosphere removal and we may become a little bit more like Venus, okay? Um, oh, one last quick thing. When I Googled ceramic planet, this is what I got. <laughs> so um, we should model, um, use, use a model called VL Planet that Rory Barnes has put together to uh, understand um, just how quickly oxygen can actually be taken up by the crust itself. Do we even need tectonism and how could we have the oxygen reacting with the crust? Um, and just in conclusion, um, Old Onya Lenga is a, is a strong analog and I encourage you to look for other field analogs for exoplanets. It's really valuable to go into the field and get a sense of what's happening because um, you'll recognize it when you get there finally to that planet. Um, and uh, atmospheric stability is a delicate balance. If we don't have these sinks, then, uh, then runaway greenhouse can occur and we can become uninhabitable. All right, thank you.